Kia ora, this is Anderson's Odyssey. I'm Jacob Anderson and my guest today is Rebet Hollis. Rebet is a multi-exit media and tech entrepreneur. How are you going, Rebet? Good, brother. How's things? Good, good. <laughs> I mean, what is, I think for a lot of people, what is a, a multi-exit uh, media entrepreneur to start? Uh, uh, started some companies and then finished some companies with a win. <laughs> So it's funny, Naval Ravikant, he says you should try and make a lot of money if you want to have impact and then give money back to organizations or give money back to uh, purposes that you believe in, which is kind of a, an interesting way to look at it because I think a lot of people might try and get into um, a different uh, project or a different um, thing that they're passionate about but not necessarily... Um, have the money or, or have the, 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 the right skills to do that. Do you think that that's a, a sort of in a way, a, a way that you've kind of approached kind of adding value or, or trying to, trying to help people out? Um, I don't sit back. So I always want to be creating and doing for myself. So to hand over something that I'm passionate about probably won't happen. Um, but to put fuel on the fire of other people that are doing cool stuff definitely can. So I think there's just a, probably a split between um, things that you want to put your energy towards, not just tick the box and write a check. Um, and because I, I guess I love the game too much and I, I love doing what I do, I don't really see that happening. <laughs> That's just being honest. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <pretty. laughs> yeah, no, no, fair enough. And I mean, you know, people look at that in a kind of all sorts of different ways. I think what's interesting. Well, one of the one of them you, is you're delegating the care, right? Like it's easy to sign a check and get someone to do the thing, but if you really, really care and you can do the thing, and if you want to do the thing, you'll do the thing. It's, yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, maybe some people have a better skill set though, but then they would yeah their, their way of, of feeling good is is the kind of the donation or the, the 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 that's the way that they think they can add the most value and if you can earn a lot more money doing it that way then maybe that is more useful than say uh volunteering or helping out but i mean there's so many different ways to kind of look at that but one of the main things with that would be the key is always first is basically get the money and then you have the power to do what you want opposed to if you don't have the power or the money. I mean, there's, don't get me wrong. You don't need to have money to have power. You can be potentially arguably more influential without um, money and with, with certain types of people. Um, but for the majority, it translates because when you have currency, you've probably got more options. Right. Yeah. And so I think it's just a headspace coming into it. I think but so. I don't think they're intrinsically linked. Like, I don't think it's, you need money to have power and influence at all. Oh, no, no. I mean, and, and we've seen that in, uh, in, in ways where, you know, people who, who are just doing the right thing or, or kind of saying the right thing um, mm. can, uh, cr you know, create a, a, a movement or, or create a kind of an, a shared value that I think is, is, fairly universal in a lot of ways, but often uh, people are kind of stuck in their own life or kind of that they don't kind of have the freedom or the, or the ability to kind of fully express themselves in a way that's articulate. Yep. Probably pretty accurate. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's funny that like this year I sort of see it as a bit of a software update. We look through all of the history and we look through all of the things and we're trying to get rid of a lot of the bad stuff and then try and focus on where we can improve things. Um, and then also there's become a lot of new innovation as well. And, and we're seeing a lot of good kind of come out of this, but we still actually have a long way to go. Um, what, what, are, what are you in, in the, sort of in that tech landscape or, or, I mean, we're seeing things from zoom and we're seeing these kind of new conversations and new ideas emerge, but what, what are you sort of, seeing or, or thinking that kind of we're going to pick up that's that's new and, and kind of useful out of all of this probably just the instant one is people's psychologies change to how business can still operate i think the mind sheets i mean for those who have either been you know entrepreneurs or worked out of laptops and been able to travel around and whatever this is normal for them 
but if your life has been the way you thought it was of I wake up an hour and a half of traffic each way, I sit in a cubicle, I do my thing, then I piss off and another hour and a half of traffic. Like if you say that mindset, um, I definitely think after a couple of months of, of lockdown, but publicly listed trading, publicly traded um, companies are still operating. Thousands of employees are still working. Uh, everyone has gone remote. I actually think probably just the biggest sea change is not necessarily the tech that's coming onto the market, but it's actually the mindset shift of the masses. Um, because when you're an early adopter or if you're in there first or you're always sort of pushing and so nothing, you know, change is normal. Like you want change, you want to be testing and adapting and evolving. But you know, if you're regular Bob from Invercargill, you know, your life's dramatically different when, you know, you've been put through, I guess what the world has been put through in the last couple of months. So I think probably just the biggest thing that's new is hopefully people's eyes being open to the, the true value of technology to be able to create a more efficient life. And, um, and, and I think that's probably just the big one, the headspace, I would say the headspace of, of, of the world has probably shifted quite dramatically in this, in this last couple of months. Yeah. I, I think I've seen, not just not just that in terms of a sort of operational level at at home or being able to work and kind of people really rethinking if if they need those big office spaces like they used to, which is kind of an interesting idea in general, but also the fact that we can operate at a sort of a slower scaled back kind of less um, consuming lifestyle which is kind of what we we need to think about and obviously in terms of sustainability that's not you know what just happened was isn't a practical solution by any means but we can look at different ways to try and reduce impact look at different ways to try and live uh, kind of in a more balanced lifestyle both for ourselves and for the resources and, and, and the planet as well which is really interesting and I think you know this is one of those kind of once in a generational kind of moments, but you know, every sort of five or 10 years, we kind of have these little steps where we incrementally kind of level up, I guess. And I think this, this year in particular is a huge one for leveling up in so many different ways, but we still have got a long way to go. What's been interesting about the whole kind of the Black Lives Matter movement for me is kind of, you hear these stories, you know, everyone knows about slavery in, uh, in America. Um, but we haven't really talked about the fact that, uh, that we are still see seeing slavery occurring in, um, in, in Arab countries, which is kind of hasn't been talked about at all, which I, kind of, I, I find kind of interesting how um, we've, we've selectively, well, and I think it's probably not, not deliberate, and I don't think anyone's kind of doing that on purpose. It's just because of the access to information. But what's, what's the kind of the the mood like at the moment in america have things started to settle down or is there still kind of a lot of tension there yeah i i settled down probably is maybe it's settled, settled down physically um from the streets not being burnt um <laughs> so that would probably be so physically yes but protests are still happening people are still not happy um, there's a bunch of resentment and tension at all parts of society and community. And so, um, is, are things resolved? No, you, you've got, you know, hundreds of years, obviously I, I, I'm a Kiwi and born in New Zealand and lived in New Zealand. Uh, my wife's from the States, but the, you know, hundreds of years doesn't get fixed in a hundred days, you know, and the, the depths of all of those, their cares and the acknowledgement for the stuff that happens in the past. The only thing similar to New Zealand, obviously was the, between the, 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 the Pakeha and the Maori population with, with what happened there. But now how both of those things have been dealt with, that's, um, I think the approaches even from New Zealand to Australia with how we have, we've approached culture to the Aboriginals or to the indigenous people, it's been different approaches. Um, so in, in many ways you could be proud, you know, I'm very proud to say I'm, I'm from New Zealand and I'm Maori. Um, but, you know, for as much as the Black Lives Matter stuff is going on here, everyone's got their own, everyone's got their own legacy, you know, and it's just kind of sad to, to watch it play out in many respects because obviously on, on top of all of it, you've got a, you know, a health crisis, which is making life very, very tricky. So um, what's the vibe like? Pretty stuffed. 
<laughs> it, it's it seems like it's a kind of everything's compounded right it would be it's kind of difficult to know if it would have played out in a similar way have everyone not been already under pressure from the pandemic and then kind of you know obviously with Trump and everything else that's going on there's kind of all of these things kind of fueling everybody up and it seems you now you know you watch tv and the media is sensationalizing everything which i think kind of ramps everything up and then people are on their phones all day and then that kind of ramps everything up so we're kind of it feels like everything's kind of hyperactive at the moment or if we're all kind of we've got road rage and we can't kind of get out of the car and go for a run and just kind of all sit down and have these rational conversations and i don't, I don't understand why it's so difficult for, I mean, you sit down with people and, and usually if you sit down with someone one-on-one, -on -one, you can have a pretty rational conversation, but as soon as kind of the media start talking or you kind of, you get in a room with people that kind of, kind of really ratchets up. I mean, you know, a simple example that, that I like to think about is, or, or, or can, could use is, you know, when we had the, the school strike for climate movement and the whole, um, conversation online and, and in the media was should the students be wagging or not and it's like that's not even the converse, that's not even the problem we should be trying to talk about carbon pollution here let's actually talk about the real issues and and how do you pull that kind of that 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 layer back and get people to actually sit and talk about the actual issue you know be that kind of the history and helping people understand the history of of, 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 you know, different people's backgrounds and trying to sit and reflect and understand that, or, you know, how do we actually talk about solving carbon issues with or carbon pollution without um, kind of getting caught up in that sort of the human aspect. But I mean, obviously we're, we're not rational beings and we all have this bias, but, and, and it's probably even more ramped up in America, do you think? Or, or, or I mean, we are very lucky, I think in New Zealand to, to kind of have, a much better way to kind of sit and, and we can do that but, but what's your kind of perspective on that kind of coming from both both uh here in the states i guess it's the approaches right um relates back to power money and ego you know and then you put legacy on top of it because legacy set those biases of how it's always been for certain ways and so you that for them that's their truth you know there's certain and that's where the, the empathy from the other side needs to take place. It's not, it's not fair to judge someone from your perception of what their truth is. Not saying what's right or wrong, but in their world, that's their truth. <laughs> you know? And I think when you have that conversation, um, it changes a bit, but you know, I would, I would probably say Kiwis feel like we've addressed a lot of, our bad past reasonably well, but there's clearly a lot, lot more to go. Um, case in point, you know, they're talking about taking down different statues and stuff now, blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, before George Floyd, would they've tried to take those statues down? What, what happened? What was the moment? And so it just sort of triggered something, you know, you ask another question would be not so much, is it right or wrong for, for this statue? It'd be like, well, if it was a black cop that killed a black person, would the world have blown up the way it did in America? Probably not, you know, it's because as soon as it was color, then it was race, then it was div divisive, then it was legacy, then it was power, then it was authority, then it was politics, then it was community, you know, like, and so you can see how one seemingly small thing um, can extrapolate out because of the narrative of, of what those things represent. And so sometimes I don't, sometimes it's not necessarily the thing. Sometimes it can be what it represents. Um, and then when you put that tension you know, cranked up over generations. Um, you can see how people have got to a point, 100%, 100%. Not saying it's right or wrong. I mean, definitely, you know, pieces of shit breaking in and stealing flipping Yeezys to try and sell on the streets for 500 bucks. Probably not the, that's probably not in the, in the spirit of things. But um, the intention of what people are trying to, to rectify, I think is, um, 
it's pretty admirable in some respects, but just it's clearly not done safely. So, so you can't have mixed feelings about that as well. But yeah, I think the, the approach to how all of the other different countries in the world has been quite interesting, not only with the health crisis, but also with how they, I guess, try to, you know, reset the landscape of, of where they've come from and where they're going. Well, all of the, it seems that all of the kind of steps where people are trying to make progress, there's always a sort of small minority that speak incredibly loud and appear to be much bigger than they are. You know, I'm sure that with all of this, most people are kind of aware and conscious and wanting to, you know, to do the right thing in a peaceful way. But then there's a small group that kind of, uh, cause all the chaos and, and that's where the media focuses. And so they appear much bigger than they really are, but because they have a loud voice, that's what happens. But I think, you know, maybe um, we can have this kind of fragility and it's possible that, you know, more people kind of go in that direction and, what's interesting about the pandemic and the scheme of things, it's a, it's a relatively minor um, kind of breakdown of society. And it, but it just shows, you know, right at the start, we think about the panic buying and the supermarkets and things like that's pr a pretty minor thing, but it, we're, we're already on the edge. And, and, and I, I hope that uh, when we, when, when we do have the, the big one, we've learned from this, how to kind of, react appropriately and, and not kind of freak everyone out and cause too much chaos. And, and it's, it's kind of hard to know what that will, what that will look like. But I think this has given us a little bit of a glimpse as to kind of how things might break down. Uh, I mean, if you look at the reactions from everyone, they haven't been minor, it's been extreme. Um, but the, the danger would be if to the point, if this is a test run for something that is actually gnarly, we've probably had a, we're a D minus probably, <laughs> you know? And so that word resiliency is probably at the top of the food chain of every single country and government to be able to look after itself and look after its people. So um, if anything, I think when people look back and we are, we're just starting to see the start, the second wave, we don't even through this thing. This, this thing's going to be a marathon. Um, and I think the, the learnings from even just the first wave, let's hope it doesn't happen for the second and then and then so on and so forth so um you know history is going to look at 2020 as a gong show but also um quite revealing to a whole bunch of bad parts of humanity and our society right yeah and i think that goes back to that software upgrade you know i, I think hopefully and i think we will come out of this and there'll be a lot of good but at the moment we're still kind of working through all of the the challenges and you know, we, we use that, that sort of example of the the Spanish flu. I think 80% of the deaths happened in the second wave. And it appears like we're going to see probably similar sorts of challenges in, in, um, in Brazil and, and, you know, maybe in the US and, and depending how long it kind of takes for things to kind of calm down. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of seems kind of crazy, but... What, what, what do you think are some of the things that we can do or use to kind of teach and empower others to kind of reflect and, and be more kind of aware of, of these sorts of things? Well, unfortunately, humans are creatures of habit. And so by now in New Zealand, after a couple of weeks, most people are trying to get back to business as usual. Um, they're trying to go back to the way it was before and i guess the question is uh, do we actually want that is that the actual best thing um but you can't force anyone to think differently what but what you can do is um i think there's just a big disconnect between the society and the system right so in america societies feels like it's changing but will the system you know Will it become a hate crime for this thing to happen? Will you disband this? Will you, you know, that's the system. So the society's spoken, but will the system speak back? Um, and if it doesn't to an enough degree, all that's going to happen is society ends up revolting, right? 
because if there's too much of a disconnect between the two, life probably doesn't get easier. And so I think I would more just kind of question around, you know, is society aligned with the system? If the voice of the people say this, does the system accurately reflect that? Um, and there's probably minor bits in New Zealand that are probably off. Um, there's probably major bits in some other parts of the world that are off. Um, but once again, that's their own truth and that's their own landscape. But what happens pretty easily is the naivety of um, society thinking it's making a change and the system doesn't. That's when it's the game's actually lost because the system hasn't changed at all. Nothing's going to change. I think that's the str- yeah. I think that's the strength of MMP in New Zealand. While it's nowhere near perfect, we're not putting you know a left idea against a right idea and not letting the minorities kind of express their concern as well. So if you just have left versus right, that almost kind of naturally will get split further and further apart. And so you, you, then you sort of end up with a, with a kind of American model where you've just got one extreme and, and then another extreme. Um, so, you know, that is kind of the, the advantage of MMP. And it is, it is still, we, we kind of, we almost need MMP in media as well, don't we? Because media is, you know, they're kind of always just trying to put one person up against another. And, and how we, I mean, have you seen uh, uh, 846, the, the Dave Chappelle uh, clip? I mean, yep. it's, it's fascinating that a comedian, I mean, comedians are probably the last, the last kind of group of, of people that can actually speak truth to anything now. But, you know, out of all of the coverage and out of all of the things that I've seen, that seems to be the most powerful um, story that I've heard. And, and he's, you know, it's, it's not even comedy. It's half an hour of kind of history weaved with kind of current issues. And I thought it's just such a powerful way to kind of approach this. And, you know, how do we kind of have dialogues like that? Um, you know, not in the kind of amazing way that Dave Chappelle does it because he's just such a, a genius in, in so many ways. But how do we kind of get people to think and have rational conversations instead of trying to just kind of hype everything up and freak people out? Well, if you don't control the media, you don't control that conversation. If they control the, the message, they control the eyeballs and the thoughts, hearts and minds, you know. So what I do realize is that the, I've never, the power of media is up there as much as the power of politics. Um, because when you shape, shape the opinions and you shape the thought and you control the narrative, you can control the people. You control the people, you control the politics, you control the money, politics, you control the power. You know, it's influence. Um, and, you know, obviously I don't know the space well at all i don't know politics well i don't know governments well i don't know a whole bunch of those other stuff well but what i i mean i do understand media but i never really understood the true power of media and and how um simple tweets can kill people how you know simple tweets can create fear that causes panic buying and hysteria for no reason through communities the fear of missing out for others creates more fear you know that whole thing that's that's media um, now I would love to one day, you know, talk to a psychologist around the, the manipulation of, of content and energy just to see like how, like talk me through the case studies of how all this stuff happened. I think just even watching the case studies that Harvard or whoever do to the, the human dynamics of, of what's physically happened in, in around the world, it's going to be insanely mind blowing to timestamp how, movements have actually happened from media i would love to see stuff like that we see so much of this kind of power through the social media and twitter especially but there's there's got to be a lot of people who know how to use that in a in a useful way to drive positive change as well but it feels like there's just always this kind of constant stream of negative coming from all of this then you know do you have examples of that or do do you you think that we can we can find a way 
to try and rationally navigate that space instead of having this kind of online war mob mentality? No, because it's cool to join the mob, right? That's the whole point. Those that Just are trying to dunk on stuff, everyone, yeah. Yeah, like those that are, you know, trying to do cool stuff. Um, a lot of the time when those, say within charities, they're so focused within the charity and within their thing, they're not focused on the external amplification of it. They're focused on doing the doing. A lot of times when it's exploitive, other people will, you know, prey on different p- bits and pieces. So sometimes they get louder. And unfortunately, if the most exploitive are the loudest, that's when you've probably got an issue with society. Your your book Power Moves. Um, you what you're trying to do with that is is kind of, or you have, you have this goal of destroying this kind of tall poppy syndrome. Uh, what, what, what and and you you're making the book available to eight hundred thousand young Kiwis, which is which is awesome. What 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 are you trying to kind of? What is the sort of the big message or the goal around around that? Pretty pretty simple, really. I think New Zealand has a pretty big. Um, success has an awareness problem you know knowing it's okay to be good at something has isn't embraced if you look at the psychology of you know kids in sport or kids that selling at school or whatever in the states parents will you know put a flipping sticker on the car and yell it from the rooftops in new zealand it's like oh no no it's all g no 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 you know that psychology when now i've got nothing there's a difference between confidence and arrogance that my concern is those that aren't confident don't try. And if they don't try, they'll end up having regret because they didn't do, they didn't go after something that they wanted to, they were passionate about. So it's actually this kind of idea where, you know, how do you stop having future regret? How do you wake up regardless what you do and be like pumped that you did it? Not, Oh, I never tried that thing because, you know, Sally from accounts said I was dumb or Bob said it was shit or, my mates thought it was stupid stuff that, you know, cause when you're older, they're not going to be there for you. They're not the ones that are doing stuff. So if you look at just, and I, I, I feel it's changing just a little bit and we want to support the underdog and we want to, you know, back it more. But I think it's probably once again, it's the mindset shift of why can't we, why don't we, you know, that, that, that thing. And the reality is, you know, tall poppy syndrome and all that stuff that was there long before I've been here. It's just that I know that that deep little underbelly that, that, that whittles away under the surface all around New Zealand is stopping a lot of people's future dreams from happening. The majority of the time that they do that is because they've got their own insecurities about not going after what they want. So they want to hold everyone back down crabs in the barrel shit. That's all it is, you know? And so, um, I would have this thing where I keep saying, you know, New Zealand wins when New Zealand does win. So do we want this country to win? <laughs> so if this country needs to win, people need to do cool shit. So why don't you support the people? But they usually don't. What's, what's fascinating is we're, we, we're quietly, we're so proud, you know, behind the scenes, everyone's patting themselves on the back. So, you know, we're the best country. This is amazing. Um, but that, that you know, but you can't kind of express that in this. It's it's a it's a weird kind of cultural thing that we've grown up doing, and and then we also you know, unfortunately, I think we're still kind of in this mentality that we can only be a primary producer and do tourism. We we have we're starting to break out of that kind of thinking, but we're still so fixed on growing things you know, having animals on, on, on farms and, and doing tourism. And obviously this pandemic's making us take a, a good look at, at tourism. Um, we're still growing things, you know, we can still feed about 50 million people, which is, which is incredibly useful. But how do we start thinking about other things? How do we think about the technologies? How do we think about we're the perfect place to do it? You know, I think we could become, especially in the next year or two, we could look to try and be the, you know, the, the Hollywood of, of the South Pacific because they're the only place in the world ca- that can fully operate. You know, we, could, we can start to look at those things. We can, we can, if you make software, you can sell it anywhere. You don't have to be in a factory doing it. Why? I mean, I think the remoteness is, is part of why we've kind of kept some of that, that thinking, but how we bring in that new talent, bring in those new ideas. I think that's, 
that's going to help for the next generation. And when you did that tour, uh, you know, what were the what were the sorts of things that you were noticing that that young people were after, or what are, what are the sort of conversations that you're hearing? The um, the interesting bit that I thought was if you take the same fifteen year old kid, um, but you went to different parts of New Zealand you'd have the same kid in the same world with different problems based on the geogra- geography of where they lived, you know? So up far north, uh, there was more P. Coming into Auckland, there's more gangs. Came down to the kind of the, the West Coast uh, a bit and then there was suicides. Came down south, domestic abuse, right? And so the same kid, same world, different location, different problem. Um, and it was, it made me just think like, you know, that environment that that kid grows up in is going to give them a different challenge. Is it P or suicide? Is it gangs or your parents beating you up? And the domestic violence thing going down South was really interesting because there weren't obviously gangs. P wasn't sort of big, but then you think about that vibe of, you know, we live in such a, you know, great, amazing places. This is perfect. But if the parents aren't happy, where do they bring that stress back into? the home, you know? And so the kind of the, the meta thinking of, well, why, 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 why? You kind of go, go down that rabbit hole a little bit and you can sort of see. So um, I, was, I was really naive to that fact. Um, and also what I thought was quite interesting is everyone, you know, wants to be inspired, but everyone has access to inspiration. If you've got YouTube, you can just go onto YouTube and type an inspiration video and watch something. But that's not true inspiration for them because I think they need to see it, feel it, touch it. They need to make it tangible. And so I think from what I felt anyway was just bringing in a little bit of that tangibility to real world inspiration made more a 10 times difference than a YouTube clip where they're not there, they're not present, they can't see them, they can't touch them, they can't feel them, they can't engage with them, they can't, you know. And so, so it made me realize that um, there are a lot of, for as perfect as New Zealand is, there are a shit ton of issues. And simultaneously, the, the, that, cons, that, that deep desire for genuine human connection, I don't think is going to go anywhere. Ever. I think, yeah, I, I think, you know, and there's no shortage of inspiration. You can almost teach yourself anything if you have the, the drive to do it now, which is amazing what the internet's provided us but if you're a young kid and you don't see somebody who has a similar path to you and they've then come out the other side and have achieved this then you almost don't have that self-belief and I think that self-belief is is far bigger than any kind of YouTube video or or book or, or information that you have access to it's how do I learn something or believe in myself that I can actually achieve this. And then once you sort of do that first step, then how do you surround yourself with others who are trying to achieve similar goals? And I think that's the part that we still have to get a lot better at and figure out how we can create the right role models that then go back into those communities that don't have the opportunities or don't have that self-belief that so many others have? Well, it's breadcrumbs, right? That's what I was just writing down there. Um, that's what I think of it. It's, it's like, what are the small little bits of positivity that you can create and leave in the world that other people find a little trail to, you know, I would think that if a 15 year old sees me now at 35, still wearing a $7 t-shirt talking shit, wearing a, wearing a hat and some Jordans, but I'm in this totally other world. They're going to be oh, wait a second, you could, he looks like me, he talks like me, but he's like doing this kind of cool shit. That's mean. How do you do that? Oh, whoa. You know, but there is a visibility issue around what success can look like. And this goes for women in power. It goes for Pacifica and Asians and a whole bunch of different looks and feels for disabilities and all access, whatever it is. I've seen a bunch of it. You know, my, my world is extremely eclectic with the types of crew that I hang out with and roll with. And it's not about the type of person. It's about the, the character of the human, you know, like I mess with good people and regardless what age you are, what you look like, dress like, act like, couldn't give a shit. But so I think these, um, the awareness around those that, 
those that are different, I think it's getting a lot better. And I think that's really good. I, I don't think it's getting worse because my life's getting easier. So if it was getting, if it was getting harder and harder for me as I was going up, I would see it was changing and getting worse, but it's not, it's getting easier. More doors are opening, more people are more serious, other, more, more of others can do similar stuff. So, so net net, I feel that the game is shifting in New Zealand quite a bit for what success can look like. And if I'm one small, super small part of it to help, you know, the brick, I, I keep thinking about this kid called Rangi from Rotorua. I think about Rangi from Rotorua, the 15 year old, you know, if I can get to him without seeing him because I created some breadcrumb from, you know, a chat like this or something that pops up somewhere and there's visibility, that's the start. Cause as long as there's awareness, then you can get educated as when you get educated, you can go and execute. And when you get execute, then that's when society shifts that that's where stuff changes. And so that long tail of the long game, like approaching this like chess is something that I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty passionate about. I think, I think that's a fantastic way to, to end the podcast. Do you have, do you have anything to kind of add or, or kind of finish on a bit? No, no, re- really appreciate it. Good chat. So thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks and cheers for listening, everyone.